that we have the ability and the opportunity to be here tonight. And we pray that you be with us as we study together with Andrew as he teaches the class. We pray that all of us will have benefited from the time we spend here together tonight and that you will be honored and pleased in Jesus' name. All right, so we're continuing our class of individuals that not the biggest part of any individual book is written about, but they are no less influential. In fact, tonight I would suggest that this guy's influence is very outsized, unfortunately, to the not-so-good part. All right, so what point in time are we talking about with Jeroboam here in the time of Israel's history? Divided kingdom. Very start of the divided kingdom. So, starting off then, is actually at the end of Solomon's reign. And at this point in time, Israel is at its greatest extent of territory in history. Somebody could read, Zach, could you read Deuteronomy 12, verse 24? Earl, did I get you to read Joshua 1 verses 4 when he's done? And uh, Mr. Master, could I get you to read 1 Kings 4 20 through 21? Me? Yeah. 1 Kings 4 20 through 21 when Earl's done with his. Zach, you got it? <coughs> yeah, I think. Nope. Oh, didn't type in the right one. All right, let's start Joshua 1, 4. <clears throat> okay. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea, toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. All right. Mm -hmm. I think you want 1124. 1124, okay. Try 1124. Awesome. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon, and from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. All right, First Kings 4, 20. 21. For verse 20 and verse 21 as well. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the Order of these, they, they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. All right, so is it reign of Solomon that Israel extends out to the fullest part of the promised land that God had promised, all the way from Egypt up to the Euphrates River? Um, actually, some of your more I can't remember if they're the Orthodox Jewish people or another group of the Jews think that Israel's establishment was because Israel never reigned to the Euphrates River, but here we see that Israel did reign to the Euphrates River, just not for a very long period of time because of what happens next. All right, so King Solomon. King Solomon, during his reign, how many wives did the guy have? Seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. First Kings, chapter eleven.
All right, so what was the problem with these wives? In verse 3, we see he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And what happened with the wives? What did they do? Return his heart away from God. That is correct. So, uh, Daryl, could I get you to read 1 Kings 11, starting in verse 3, running down to verse... Run it through 12. Actually, just run it through 13. 3 through 13. Mm -hmm. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For it came about when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to his other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. And Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Alright. So, we're at the end of the United Kingdom here. And what does God say he's going to do because of his disobedience? All of it? All but one tribe. <coughs> All right, so in the days of Solomon, he raises up adversaries to Solomon. In 1 Kings 11, 14 through 25, could I, Rick, could I get you to read that for me, please? 14 through 25? Yeah. Then the Lord raised up an adversary to Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He's, he was of the royal line in Edom, for it came about when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain, and had struck down every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel stayed there six months until he had cut off every male in Edom. <clears throat> then Hadad fled to Egypt, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants, with him, while Hadad was a young boy. And they arose from Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt to Pharaoh king of Egypt, who gave him a house and assigned him food and gave him land. Oh, I need to keep going. 20, you said 20. Okay. Now Hadad found great favor before Pharaoh, so that he gave him in marriage the sister of his own wife, the sister of Taphanes, the queen. And the sister of Taphanes bore his son Genabath, whom Taphanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Genabath was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. But when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his father, so that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Send me away that I may go to my own country. Then Pharaoh said to him, But what have you lacked with me, that behold, you are seeking to go to your own country? And he answered, Nothing. Nevertheless, you must surely let me go. God also raised up another adversary to him, Rezan, the son of Eliada, who had fled from his lord, Hadadezer, king of Zobah. And he gathered men to himself and became leader of a marauding band after David slew them of Zobah 
and they went to Damascus and stayed there and reigned in Damascus. So he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, along with the evil that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Aram. All right, so it's trouble in the kingdom. So Solomon reigned from the border of Egypt to the river, but this guy is ruling in Damascus, which is right about in here. So what does that going to do to the part of his kingdom up here? I'm going to start cutting it off. What other country of note is there in this chapter that's an adversary of Solomon? Edom. Edom. And um, Solomon's first foreign wife, who was she? Daughter of Pharaoh. Daughter of Pharaoh. He was given the Edomite his refuge. Pharaoh. So Solomon's gaining enemies all the way around him, either subtly or outright. But then comes the greatest threat to Solomon's reign. Starting in verse 26, and Run to the end of the chapter. Who's be willing to read 26 through 43? Or do you want me to split that up? All right, 26. You said 26? Through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> then Solomon's servant Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zerida, whose mother's name was Zer Zerua, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the men to Milo and repaired the damages to the city of David his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. Now it happened at that time, when Jeroboam went out to Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah the Shalonite met him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for this is the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshiped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Shemosh, the god of the Moabites, Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways, to do what is right in my eyes, and keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes, and to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a land before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your hearts, your heart's desires, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as my servant David did. Then I will, I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I build for David, and will, and will give Israel to you. And I will afflict with the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam. And Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt, so Shishak, the king of Egypt, to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, all that he did, and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? In the period that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was three years. Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. All right. So Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. What tri tribe was he from? Ephraim. And who was Ephraim? Son of Joseph. The son of Joseph. Son of Joseph. Mm -hmm. 
So, what here is said about Jeroboam? Anything in particular strike him? Man of standing, or remember, he was a man of standing. In other words, that's a positive thing that's said about him, actually. God gave him every opportunity to succeed, really. God gave him every opportunity to succeed and had 10 pieces of the kingdom. What got Solomon to see him? He's industrious. He's industrious. In fact, that's about the only, unfortunately, that's about the only good thing that the Bible says about the man, which is, can probably be made a sermon sometime about it. The only good thing they can say about you is you are good at your job. It doesn't say much about you. It's also a valiant warrior. It's also a valiant warrior, also in the same sentence. He is mentioned around a hundred times throughout the whole testament. So he said he's an Ephraimite, mighty man of valor and industrious. Where does he run? Egypt. Runs to Egypt. This we start to notice a pattern here. About Egypt. I think they were good friends, weren't they? <laughs> So good friend of me that they're going to show up to loot Solomon's plunder about five years after he's dead. Um, and Jeroboam returns. So in 1 Kings chapter 12, Olivia, would you mind raising 12, 1 through 11, please? Yeah, 1 through 11. Mm -hmm. okay. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it. He was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt, that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father, King Solomon, while he still lived, and he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him, and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. All right. So Rehoboam goes to Shechem, where he's going to be coronated as king of Israel. But the people want something. What is that? Burden light. Burden light. They want some tax relief. <laughs> Solomon's the richest guy in the world, and he's still taxing them like crazy. Not only that, but he's also having them do work service every few months. And they're like, okay, can we lighten up on this a bit? <clears throat> so, Solomon goes to the Advisors of his dad, what did they say? Go easy on him. Wow. What? What did the young guys say? Yeah. Okay. It's time to prove yourself. <laughs> Act of strength. Show yourself. Yeah. So, 
it's interesting, he, it was wise for him to consult the elders, but he, but he never asked God what to do. No, he didn't, although I could, would question whether it would have mattered either way, given that it's already foretold that he's going to lose it. So, he asked for three days. Why do you think he asked for three days? Do you think it that took that long to gather everybody, his groups, the two groups together to ask him this? Especially since all Israel is already here. Or do you think he's wishy-washy enough that, that it took him that long to, to decide between the two? Or did he just ask him for enough time to make sure that he thinks enough for us? Could be. But he thinks about it and it goes the wrong way. Conies, could you read 12 through 17? Actually, go through 19. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, Come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord. To fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shilonite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Look after your house, David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam sent out Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor. But all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel had been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So he listens to the advice of the young whippersnappers, and what's the response? Bad advice. Bad advice, and what does Israel say to him? And they seceded from the union. <laughs> to your tents, O Israel. Where have we heard that before? We have no share in David. Correct. And that's in 2 Samuel 20, verse 1, if we grab that real quick. Yes, please. Now there happened to be a worthless man whose name was Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjamite. He blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, so to speak. What passage was that? 2 Samuel 20, verse 1. This is right after the rebellion of Absalom. So, Rehoboam and his usual wise decisions in this chapter decides to try to patch things up. He's going to send out the head of the tax service <laughs> out to see if he can get this straight. <laughs> yeah, that don't go so well. What did they do to him? They stone him. So Rehoboam flees to Judea. He tries to call out an army against them, but the prophet of God comes up and tells him to stop and go home. And he does the first smart thing in the whole chapter and listens. But since we're a little short on time, we won't cover that. All right. So Jeroboam now has... The northern part of the kingdom of Israel is now his. And so, in 1 Kings 12, 25, just 25, someone, Derek, can I get you to read verse 25? Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, 
and lived there, and he went out from there and built Penuel. All right, he's out there building cities. Sounds like everything's going okay, but what happens? He starts thinking to himself, well, if people go back to Jerusalem to worship, they're going to turn away from me and go back to Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. So he builds some high places and two golden calves, so they'll stay in the northern kingdom, regions of worship there. Where does he build them? Samaria. Yeah. One in Bethel and one in Dan. One in Bethel and one in Dan. And what did you say they were? Uh, they were golden calves. That ring a bell? Where have we heard that story before? <coughs> Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Where did they just come from? Where had they just come from? Egypt. Where has Jeroboam just come from? Egypt. Difficult to pin down the identity of this golden calf, but there are 1,400 gods in the Egyptian pantheon, many of them representing livestock, including golden calves, the biggest ones that most scholars think that they were modeled off of, whether Hathor, Atlas, or Ta, are commonly thought to be either the gods that they worship or were inspired by them. So as we can see, once again, Egypt's the downfall of Israel in part. All right, so this is totally not what the prophet told Jeroboam to do, is it? What did the prophet tell him? Honor me and honor, honor God and he'll give, I'll make your family great throughout the generations. So in a few years, he's over here building golden calves. So God tries to warn him off. Chapter 13. If I could have Zach, could you read 1 through 10 of chapter 13? And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on him the priests of the high places who make offerings on him, and human bones shall be burned on him. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. And the man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you. And I will not eat bread or drink water in this place, for so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the way that he came. So he went another way, <coughs> did not return by the way that he came to that. Alright, so, just as with the kings of Judah later and the kings of Israel, God doesn't just let him wander into this without at least giving a warning. So he's giving a warning here. What does he say? saying that that altar is going to be, um, they're going to 
sacrifice and the priests of those false religions, and uh, they're probably going to be burned there. And who's going to do that? The king that will be born in uh, Josiah. Of the house of David. Yeah. So David, who the kingdom was split and given to him, a king of David's line is going to come up there and burn one of Jeroboam's greatest feats. Highly exclamation mark in that <coughs> quote. And this does happen towards the end of the Judean kingdom, about less than 30 some odd years before they themselves are dragged into Babylonian captivity. So, Jeroboam is at present when the prophet gets there, what happens? What signs are he given that this is truly going to come to pass? His hand. His hand withers up. And then the altar. And then the altar splits. So, for the first and only time, what is that we see? What does Jeroboam do? Backs down. Backs down and begs for mercy. You notice he says, ask the Lord your God. He does say that. He doesn't say, ask the Lord my God. Um, in verse uh, 6. Yeah. Yeah. The king answered and says, man of God, please appear the favor of the Lord your God. which could tell you that Jeroboam was done down this road perhaps a little too far. Don't know when he got there, whether he went there in Egypt or where he did it afterwards, hard to say. Doesn't really give enough information on that matter. And then he tries to bring in the man of God to his house. But what does he do? Can't do it. Can't do it. In the interest of time, we're going to skip over the account of the prop, the man of God, and the old prophet of Bethel. But uh, briefly, can someone summarize what happened there? Well, if I have it correct, the, the prophet that, that spoke to uh, Jeroboam was told you. To you, know, you just go on home, don't go anywhere, just, just get straight home. And of course, when um, Jeroboam asked him to stay or whoever was there, he, he refused. But then this old prophet asked him to turn aside, and he listened to the old prophet, disobeying God's command. That's a challenging thing to work out anyway, so I'd skip it if I were you too. <laughs> that is one of the strangest accounts in the Bible because we have no idea what his motivations were. Does it really tell us or what happens? You said he got, came back, and then what happens? Uh, he by a lion or something? He was, or mauled by a lion. <laughs> so, after this event, starting in verse 33, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again he made priests from every class of people, from the high places, whoever he wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. Hard to say, especially with what he told the prophet back in the verse 6 as to whether he had any intention to turn around or whether the death of the prophet had any because he didn't listen, had any motivation for him not to turn. Not a whole lot, I don't know if we can do more to speculate on that part. But either way, he doesn't turn. So, so starting in 14, we see judgment starting to fall on the house of Jeroboam. Daryl, could 
you read 14, 1 through 17? At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise now and disguise yourself so that they may not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam, and go to Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah the prophet is there who spoke concerning me that I would be king over this people. And take ten loaves with you, some cakes and a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will happen to the boy. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. You shall say thus and thus to her, for it will be when she arrives that she will pretend to be another woman. And it came about when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet coming in the doorway, that he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam, why do you pretend to be another woman? For I am sent to you with a harsh message. Go say to Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. Yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my house and who followed me with all his heart, to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you, and have gone and made for yourself other gods, molten images to provoke me to anger and cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free in Israel, and I will make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam, as one sweeps away dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat, and he who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens will eat. <coughs> Now you, arise, go to your house, when your feet enter the city, the child will die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he alone and Jeroboam's family shall come to the grave, because in him something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam this day and from now on. How far was through, um, through 17. Yeah. For the Lord God will strike Israel as a reed that is shaken in the water, and he will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers, and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River, because they, have, because they have made their Asherah, provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam, which he committed, and with which he made Israel to sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arose she was entering the threshold of the house, the child died. Read 18 too. And all Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant, Ahijah the prophet. All right, so we see the one time that Jeroboam sins and asks for God is on account of the fact that his child is sick. Anything we can take out of that? Do you think it was... But he phrases it once again in a weird way. He doesn't say, go to the prophet and ask of God what will happen to him. He says, go to the prophet and he will tell you what will happen. He, does, he doesn't send her to... Yeah, which is strange, also. <clears throat> so, the prophet's old and blind. So God tells him she's coming, and what is the message that he gives? It's interesting to hear that that child is the only thing that the prophet said he's good. Mm -hmm. And the only one that will be married. It is. I was getting there. He dies, too. 
which is also an interesting thing. <clears throat> He's the only thing good in the house of Jeroboam, yet he dies. Is that as we saw with David? Death isn't always a punishment to the person that gets killed. It's merciful in this particular case. Yep. All right, so that's the first pet, so we got to hurry it up. All right, so Jeroboam goes to war with Judah in 2 Chronicles 13. Unfortunately, though, his legacy continued on. In almost every other 100 verses that the Bible tells throughout the Old Testament, can anybody quote the one thing that is always usually said? They followed in the ways of their father, Jeroboam, and did evil inside them. It's something like that. Sins of Jeroboam. Well, for anyway, it sends a cherubim. In 1 Kings 15, 25 through 30, Jeroboam's house was destroyed by the next king of Israel, uh, who was also given the same palm as Jeroboam was, but like Jeroboam, um, walked against God and he successfully, basically, into a Syrian captivity, have every house of Israel is destroyed because they do not follow the Lord their God. Um, unfortunately, in First Kings, sorry, Second Kings, chapter seventeen, verse twenty-one, um, through twenty-two. Um, okay, we should read that real quick. Second Kings seventeen twenty-one through twenty-three. When he had torn Israel from the house of David, they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel away from following the Lord and made them commit great sin. And the sons of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel from his sight, as he spoke through all the servants, the prophets, so Israel was carried away into exile from their own land to Assyria to this day. So as the prophet prophesied back when she came in to inquire about the child, Jeroboam's ultimate legacy would be Israel getting carried away into <coughs> Assyrian captivity. Um, and that wraps up Jeroboam. Next week is Ahab. We're going to have to try to figure out how to condense all that information. It's even about half a book. So, anyway, Ahab next week. And that's it.
Um, I don't know who the song leader is tonight. If you've got it, uh, would you mind doing 237? It's a great song, you know, wrap my short talk up in a nice little bow. Okay. And while you're turning there, we'll talk about song number 237. I'm just going to read the lyrics. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from the lighthouse evermore, but to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen you may rescue, you may save. Now, that is obviously a really beautiful song. And uh, I remember a couple years ago, we were singing it, and I was sitting there thinking, what on earth does that mean? The, let your lower lights be burning. And uh, so I looked it up. And if I can get my notes out here. And what lower lights are, as far as my research could tell, is you have the, the lighthouse, and then below the lighthouse, you'll either have a smaller lighthouse, a lighthouse type thing that will reflect the light off the lighthouse, or a village that has a lot of lights. And uh, what that does is it sheds more light on the ocean so that the ships that have seen the lighthouse can come in sa safely uh, without hitting any stones and stuff that maybe the big lighthouse doesn't show. And I was thinking, okay, I'm not sure how important that would be. You would think, you know, a ship's lights would kind of cover that problem. But I found a story about a ship uh, at some point in the past that saw the lighthouse and was coming in. They radioed the lighthouse and they asked, "Where are the lower? Where is your lower light?" This is one of those with the with the smaller lighthouse, and they said the light burned out. And the lighthouse keeper said, "Can you make it?" And the captain replied, "Well, we have to." They didn't make it. The ship crashed into some rocks. And all of, if uh, or most, of the passengers on board died. So, and obviously they're important. But jumping back to the song, I thought it was a really very good poetic way that it referred to us as the keepers of the lights. If you uh, look in the Bible, and I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew 5 and verse 14. Matthew 5 and verse 14. And it says there, and this is Jesus talking, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor, the, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, and they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So I kind of want to put this in a kind of a, I'll say a parable perspective. If we look at it this way, that God is the light of the world as he is, and he's the big lighthouse. And we as Christians are the lower lights, or the village that's underneath that lights, you know, for the rocks. When people get curious about God, they want to come to his light. And we as Christians, it's our job to help them find their way in. 
hence our lower lights. And I think a perfect example of that would be Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 and verse 26. Acts 8 and starting in verse 26. And it says there, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, actually I'm just going to skip down to, yeah, I'll just skip 27. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the Isaiah, the prophet. When the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot, Philip ran to, to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet, prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch saw the lighthouse, but he couldn't navigate his way through the rocks. He didn't, he didn't understand how, so the lower light in the form of Philip helped him. And that's our job. We have to pe show people the plan of salvation to hear, or in this case, he'd already heard he, we, he needed more teaching. To believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and in order for our lights to not go out, like it said in Matthew, we have to remain faithful unto death. And that's my lesson. So. Rightly beams our Father's mercy from the
good to see everyone out this evening. I'd like to thank Jesse for the good short talk and Andrew for his class out here this evening. Uh, are there an any announcements that need to be made before we are dismissed? Uh, Susan Rolf is not here again tonight and, and it's because she's still not feeling well. She's okay. still having a kind of rough. Okay, so Susan Rollman's still not feeling well and having a rough time, so we need to keep her in our prayers. Are there any other announcements? If not, then we will be led in our closing. Pray with me, please. Our God and Father, we're thankful to be here tonight to study your word and uh, pray that our hearts and minds have been open to what you have revealed to us, that we will take these things uh, that we have learned this evening into consideration and strive to uh, serve you more perfectly, Father, to put your will ahead of our own and uh, uh, strive to seek you daily. Uh, we're mindful of all those who are struggling with various challenges, uh, Sister Ruhlman, we're mindful of Olivia's friends and their, their baby Ambrose and pray your blessings upon them as well as others who are having challenges that um, that they will be comforted in you and that you uh, be your will this this child will be okay and Sue will return to her health and that um, that they will lean on you father for strength and for guidance we thank you for this church which meets here father for each individual who makes up this body and we pray that you be with each of us as we strive to to seek um, to please you and to seek those um, in this community father who are seeking you out and we pray for opportunities father to speak to them uh, be with us as we leave this place keep us safe and help us to return on sunday to worship you in jesus name amen